I'll introduce myself. My name is John Whitworth, and I'm the immediate past director of engagement in the School of Dental Sciences. And I'm very pleased to be part of the Insights Public Lecture Programme in this, the school and hospital's 125th year. For the last 30 of those 125 years, I've attended almost all of the dental school and hospitals, founders and benefactors day lectures. And these are annual public lectures in the school and hospital to honor those who founded the institution in 1895, and that is Messrs. Daniels, Jameson, Harper, Mark and Boone, Ratledge, and the many, many benefactors who've supported our development and progress ever since. And we stand on their shoulders with, with very grateful hearts at this stage of our development as a global top 40 ranked dental school with the top student satisfaction within the Russell Group Dental Schools and also ranked outstanding by the CQC. Now, despite our best efforts over the last several years to make our Founders and Benefactors events outward facing, public lectures, they really have not been and I'm delighted to be able to redress that tonight by being part of the Insights Programme within the university. Welcome, and especially if you're not dental people, but please a warm embrace to the dentists in the audience as well this evening. I'm also really delighted that I can present to you an esteemed Newcastle graduate, and now the privilege to call him as a colleague, someone new to academic life, but with a rich and fascinating experience of dentistry in some of the scariest and high-stakes situations you can imagine. David Edwards has recently joined us from the Royal Army Dental Corps, where he served with distinction for 12 years. And it may be difficult for some of us to imagine the impact of dental problems on combat soldiers who are operating in the field, the risks and the costs of emergency evacuation, the risks to individuals and colleagues when military personnel have troubles with their teeth in situations which are the most compromising. Difficult to us imagine as well the role of dentists in managing combat soldiers with severe facial injuries or the necessary reality of body identification from dental records. And David's going to be touching on many of these. David has important and sobering stories to share. And he does so from first-hand experience of UK-based planning and delivery, in dental preparation and recovery from operational deployment, in leading military-wide sedation services, in emergency trauma management in places like Camp Bastion, Kabul, Lashkar, Sangin, and forward operating bases, in providing emergency dental care during Operation Askari Thunder 3 in Kenya, and as deputy lead for dental forensics alongside military and civilian police. It would be fair to say that he's seen some stuff and he understands the relevance of dental services in the lives of our military personnel. It's a real privilege to be able to welcome him as our 2020 Founders and Benefactors lecturer, David. Right, thanks very much, John. Um, I want to start by saying I, I don't think our profession uh, is often taken as seriously as it should be. Um, I think back to my time working on the NHS in primary care, um, and one of my favourite comments from a patient um, was when he walked in and announced that his teeth were going to buy me a new car. And I think, sadly, that is the perception from a lot of patients. We're just basically trying to extract money out of them. And there are a lot of dentists in the audience, um, and I know that they'll all agree when I say many, many patients walk in uh, and they start the consultation by using the phrase, I hate dentists. Um, it usually has some expletives in as well. Um, and when you think about it, that's an awful way to start a consultation with a medical professional. Um, but actually, if you've ever had um, toothache, you will know how debilitating it is. So this um, artwork here, depicts someone with really severe facial pain. If you have ever had the toothache, you'll be able to relate to this. Now, toothache will keep you awake at night, it'll stop you from eating, it'll stop you from performing 
um, your normal tasks, and it would be bad enough to get this at home. But as John's touched on there, can you imagine having this thousands of miles away um, as a soldier, th thousands of miles away from home, and you're having to go out on operations with a loaded rifle, and split-second decisions can mean the difference of life and death. So dentistry in the military can be really high stakes. So what I'm going to do um, tonight, we're just going to briefly look at how dentistry has kind of evolved in the army or the military. Uh, and then um, I'm going to just talk about some of my experience of delivering dental care. So back in the 1700s, of course, there were no dentists. And actually, dentistry or, or problems with your teeth is listed as the fifth or sixth biggest killer in London throughout that century. Of course, we didn't have antibiotics, but also, if you did have a problem, your only option was to go and see the barber surgeon, as depicted here. So they had no formal training, but they were able to um, burst your abscesses and try and do their best to take out your teeth. Now, it wasn't until the 18th century and early 19th century that we realised you had to have good teeth to serve in the army. It had nothing to do with um, what I've discussed before. It wasn't to do with the welfare of the soldier. It was to do with the ability to load your rifle. So this picture here actually um, depicts uh, a bullet, and above here is a paper casing. And what the soldier had to do was bite the top off the casing. They would pour the gunpowder in, pack it down, pop the, uh, the bullet in, and they could then fire their rifle. So in the 18th century, if you didn't have any front teeth, um, then you couldn't actually fight. So it really was an army that can't bite is an army that can't fight. And if you've ever heard the phrase, bite the bullet, um, we actually think this is probably where it came from. Now, the Boer War was the first time that dentistry really got uh, a mention. There were 44,000 soldiers who were killed and injured during this conflict. But actually, only, only um, well, 30,000 of those were killed or injured due to non-battle injury. So it was things like diarrhoea, and it was also things like uh, dental problems. So out of that 30,000, 5,000 of them um, were rendered unfit to fight from dental problems. And a further 2,000 had to be evacuated back to the UK because of their teeth. So... Just think about the impact that that had on the fighting force. But despite this, we still didn't have any dentists in the army. And it wasn't until World War I that really dentistry came on the radar. Now, we knew from the Boer War experience that you had to have uh, decent teeth in order to join the army. So here's a, a cartoon of a soldier being turned away from service just because of the state of his teeth. Now, looking over history, you can often have one event that can be a catalyst for change. And I think that, you know, nowadays, that event may be a celebrity uh, doing something on social media. But we had this celebrity here. So this is Sir Douglas Haig, who was a field marshal in the army. And he was the commander of the first army over in France during the First World War. We deployed out to France without taking a single dentist. And it wasn't until a month into the conflict that this chap got raging toothache and he was unable to fight. So he asked for a dentist and he was absolutely furious that there was no one that could help him. So he contacted London and within a month he'd managed to get 12 dentists a commission to the Royal Army Medical Corps. Now, by the end of World War I, there were actually 850 dentists serving. And just to give you an idea of the impact they had, we don't know any stats from the, the British dentists, but the Australian dentists alone treated over a million soldiers, and they extracted over 300,000 teeth. So the First World War brought about a huge change. And so in 1921, the Army Dental Corps was formed and we actually started to have uh, dentists in the army. Now this is a cap badge, so this is worn on a soldier's beret, and this is what identifies you as being a dentist or a dental nurse or a technician in the army. 
So you can see here it says A, D, C for Army Dental Corps. In World War II, we really knew the value of the dentist and things had moved on a long way. So here we have um, actual mobile dental surgeries that could drive around the front line and deliver really high quality care, almost the level of care that we could deliver in the UK. And these dentists actually had a lot of extra training. Amazingly, they were trained to deliver general anaesthetic, which by today's standards sounds ridiculous. But that's what they, that's what they did. That, their battle role was to deliver general anaesthetic. They were also trained to manage facial trauma. So they did a lot of surgical training before they deployed. Now, just to hammer home this point, um, we've got some soldiers here that are getting off a ship in Italy. Now, there's one soldier in particular, and um, this is my wife's granddad. And he was actually shot um, in the back of the neck by an Italian prisoner. And it was a dentist that actually put him back together and saved him. And he would very often tell this story. He was very proud of this fact. And so you can see the, the very many roles that dentists would have had. Another thing to point out, soldiers and airmen had awful injuries during the conflict. Now, this is a bunch of airmen here who have suffered very serious burns. And we'd never really had to deal with this before. So there was pioneering surgical techniques. And here we've got flaps of skin raised off the shoulder and attached to their face. And they've brought with that the blood supply. Because if you didn't do that, the flap of skin that you raised would just die. And then what we learned was, it will take on a blood supply from the face over a few weeks. And you can then sever the blood supply and reconstruct the face. Now that is a technique that we are still using today. So, and there were many other surgical techniques that were born out of necessity. When I say necessity, I mean they were faced with problems where they just didn't know what to do. And this was experimental surgery. And so having the dark sense of humour that soldiers often have, they called themselves guinea pigs. And in 1941, they formed a social club called the Guinea Pig Club. And they still met every year until 2007. And then we move on to today. So this is now the cap badge that we still wear on our berets. And this says, this is our motto here, ex dentibus ensis. So this means from the teeth, the sword. Now if we re rewind, it's awful, isn't it, this picture? <laughs> uh, I, I actually had no idea that that would turn into that, which is an equally terrible picture. But I thought I'd just embarrass myself and put it in anyway. Whilst I was at university, there was a lot going on. So obviously you've got Osama bin Laden here and Saddam Hussein, and they were in the news a lot, and there was a lot of conflict going on. Dentistry can be a very long career, and you can spend a lot of time indoors sat down. So I kind of thought I fancied a bit of an adventure, and I fancied doing something different, and I knew that if I didn't do it now, then I never would. So I ended up joining the army, and I knew if I did so, there'd be a good chance I'd be going out to the Middle East. What I hadn't reckoned on was that you have to be an officer first. And so off I went to Sandhurst, um, and we learned all about officer leadership, and we had to learn about military skills. I did kind of enjoy it, although I hated the cold, I hated the sleepless nights. Um, but at the end of all that, there's a really proud moment, and you get to uh, pass out as a commissioned officer in the Royal Army Dental Corps. And it was, I think, just before that photo was taken, and I think from my wife Helen, this is more of a grimace, because a colonel came up to me, and he announced that they wanted me to go to Hollywood. And I thought, it's obviously the good looks, and uh, I can see what they're doing here. And then it dawned on me that it was the Hollywood in Northern Ireland. Hence, Helen's grimace. And so that's a picture of me at the top of the Mourne Mountains. And it, it was a far, far cry from the, uh, the hills of Hollywood. When I got there, I realised I was probably going to have, have to order in the Factor 50. 
because most of the units in Northern Ireland were deploying out to Afghanistan, and I knew there was a very good chance I'd be joining them, and that's actually what happened. And then the other thing that happened uh, was I realised just how important it is to get the guys dentally fit before we deploy. So this is a photograph that I've taken just before I went out, and this is an RAF TriStar, and I'm actually sat with about 200 soldiers here who were about to go. And we've all had to go through the same process. We've all had to be signed off as being dentally fit before we can set foot on that plane. That's the importance that we put on dentistry. And the reason for that is, if you get a problem out on operations, how is a dentist going to get to you? Or how are you going to get to see the dentist? And we're going to touch on that a little bit later. We'll rewind a bit from that photo. Before we go out, there's a huge amount of extra training that we do. And this shows two important things. First of all, you can see the dental kit that we take with us. Now, we had to set this up and put this down many, many times. They would make things go wrong with it that you had to fix. Um, but we be became really familiar with that, and that meant that we could hit the ground running. And the other important thing is we started working as a team. So we started to learn that some members of our team had real strengths and real weaknesses, and we could start to tackle genuine problems that had happened on tour um, in an exercise environment. So they would send actors in with real you know, problems that had happened, and we'd then have to deal with them. But it was actually much bigger than that, because the entire field hospital was on exercise. Now, this is actually a mock-up of Bastion Hospital, but it's built inside a hangar in York, so the layout is the same. And the people working in there are all the same people that we'll be going with. So when we were getting our little dental scenarios, we would have to liaise with all the different departments. So if we wanted some advice on radiology, we'd go and speak to them. If we wanted to speak to the mental health team, we could go and speak to them. And it got the whole hospital working together. The other thing, of course, was they kept calling mass casualty situations, so multiple um, casualties coming in with serious injuries and we would get involved in that because as dentists we would completed a lot of extra training in managing trauma so we completed battlefield advanced trauma life support for example so we would be part of the teams that would manage the trauma and it really got us focused and hammered home the fact that we, we were training to deal with mass casualty situations every day and in the NHS you know, it might happen a few times in people's careers. You're thinking about some of the terrorist incidents that have happened. But we realised it, it could be happening every day, and it meant when we got out there, we could deal with that. There was a lot of other extra training that went on as well. This is my dental nurse, Keith with the teeth. He is on the ranges here, so we had to learn to shoot straight. We had to make sure we were fit enough. We had to learn about operational law. Um, and then that training really continued. So we would get out, uh, in this case to Afghanistan here, and we'd keep um, training with, with our rifles. And what's going on here is we've got people with machine guns and they're firing down the range and then they're getting pairs of us to run down and attack the target. So I was running down with my dental nurse uh, with machine gun fire going past me. And it certainly is a dentist, something I never thought I would do. And then it just got really crazy. Um, they had us driving around in snatch Land Rovers outside of Bastion, firing at things in the desert, which again, I, I thought, there's no way I'm ever going to have to do this. Um, and it was a totally new experience to me. And here's the team. This is the dental team working together. Here we've got our uh, Valen detectors, and these are used to detect improv improvised explosive devices, so roadside bombs. Because when we were out there, that was the real threat at that time. And if we were travelling somewhere by vehicle and we had to get out of that vehicle, then we'd have to be able to do so safely and create a safe path. And this is how you did it. So it was a huge amount of extra training before we got going. I'll very quickly show you the layout of the hospital so that when I'm talking about various things that happened over there, you'll understand, you'll be able to orientate. So just down here is the kind of main entrance for the ca casualties. So they would be brought in here and they'd be assessed and triaged in here. And this is the operating theatre here, where life-saving surgery was carried out every day. 
On here, the dental team is in a tent, but actually we managed to move into this part here, which is absolutely right because it's within the hospital. So we had a corridor uh, here with the two dental surgeries, um, and then we had mental health, we had primary health care as well, and it meant that when we had a patient that we weren't sure about, we could very quickly access the main hospital here. And it also meant that when there were patients who were triaged and they had facial injuries that could be managed under local anaesthetic, the patients could be very quickly brought down to us and we could clear the decks and we could manage them here. So we'll talk through a few examples of that. When I say primary dental care, I very quickly realised it is anything but routine primary dental care. So you can see here the kit that we've got. It looks really, really basic, but it's actually really, really good. And in this setup, I can basically perform the same standard of care that I can perform in the UK. We've got our x-ray equipment here, and all of this folds out of boxes. On a later tour, this is what it actually became. So we had a purpose-built dental centre. This is um, a central area to clean all the equipment. And you can see the quality of the kit here. And I think most places in the UK would be jealous of this. This is a gold standard surgery setup. And I think it shows you just how seriously the military take medical and dental care. This is exactly the same kit out in Kenya. This time, it's in a tent. But again, I can actually perform a really decent level of care there. And it's not to say that we didn't have to test and adjust sometimes. I wasn't expecting to be flooded out. Um, but these were the kind of things you had to just deal with and, and improvise with. So I'm going to just talk about a patient that I saw which hammered home some key points to me. Now, this patient I saw during my first week out there, he came to me with some really bad toothache and some facial swelling. And he also had some healing wounds on his face and having a chat with him he revealed that he'd been shot in the face about two weeks earlier and the bullet had passed through his face and come out of his mouth which I, I thought sounded a bit unlikely but I had a look and there was just basically pus coming out of everywhere um, and he was actually really unwell he had a raised temperature and he was he was really not not doing very well so I went and spoke to radiology and actually ordered a CT scan to see what was happening. Now, as a, a primary care dentist, this is not the kind of thing that you would normally do. But what that CT scan showed was that there were multiple fragments of the bullet still in his face, and there was a huge amount of infection around those, and he also had some facial fractures. And so my learning points from this were, firstly, I'm just going to have to deal with what comes in. There's not really anyone else to ask about this. And secondly, um, I'm going to have to take, take over this soldier's welfare, which is a dentist we're not used to doing. We normally do the treatment and then we let them leave. But this guy, how am I going to treat him? I had to make a decision that would have to be done in the UK. So I had to get him flown home. I had to arrange that. I spoke to mental health because he'd just been shot in the face and I thought he might need a bit of support. And I had to liaise with his commanding officer and I had to be quite robust in my recommendation for him to go home. <coughs> This is a case, this kind of thing we saw pretty much every single day, and it hammers home the point that you need a dentist out there. So here someone's fallen over and they've snapped, snapped this crown off at gum level. So we remove the crown and we see what's left, is there anything for us to work with? Now when we look up at the tooth here, you can see this little spot. This is the nerve of the tooth, and we can actually have a really good look at that now. So there's the nerve after we've taken it out. And so what you'll come to realise is this crown was just basically flapping around on the end of this nerve. So can you actually imagine how painful that would have been? How on earth would that soldier function? So then from a really geeky dental point of view, you've got a lot of things to think about here. Are we going to remove that root or are we going to leave it in? Am I going to let this guy go back to a forward operating base? Am I going to keep him back in Bastion? If so, how long for? So there are a lot of extra things to think about. Here's a case of, um, this is, used to be called trench mouth actually, and this affected soldiers very badly in the First and Second World Wars. And what I realised was, um, we would see an awful lot of this 
um, out in Afghanistan. And the reason is the soldiers aren't brushing their teeth. Um, they're also very run down and they're malnourished and they're very stressed. And those are perfect conditions to get this. And here is a situation which I hadn't had to deal with before. This is a failing implant. Now, you can see from the x-ray, you don't have to be a dentist to see there's a dark shadow around here, and there's not actually a lot of bone holding this in. So this was very, very loose. So I kind of advised the soldier that I'd probably have to take the implant out at some point um, in order to make him a denture. But unfortunately for him, uh, the implant came out a little bit sooner than I'd hoped. And it actually came out in the impression. So now I was really in trouble because I turned him into a, a pirate and I'd have to do something about that space straight away because teeth like to move when there's spaces. So there were many, many situations where I just had to overcome problems and get thinking. And this is just an example of someone who was brought down from um, the A&E department. So he was a, a vehicle mechanic and he'd headbutted a Land Rover. And he'd waltzed in there, and it was just a very simple laceration that needed suturing. So they wheeled him down to the dental centre, and we just closed that up. And the nice thing was about this chap, I actually bumped into him several years later. He was just walking past my surgery in Catrick, uh, and he did a double take and came in and saw me. And I'm pleased to say that uh, you could hardly see the scar. So it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't too bad. And a final note. We actually were really keen on health promotion out there. I've shown you that picture of the trench mouth, and that's because when a soldier's going out to a forward operating base, they don't have a lot of space to carry kit, and often the first thing that they'll, they'll you know, bin off is the toothbrush. They'll not bother with the toothbrush. So this here is my dental nurse, Louise. She was particularly savage. She was very, very keen on people brushing their teeth, and she'd give them a real dressing down if they didn't do so. She was absolutely wonderful, and she actually became part of the team. I showed you earlier the training we did when we arrived, with firing rifles, driving around his snatched Land Rovers. She became part of that team, and she actually spoke to all 9,000 soldiers that arrived to take over us at the, end of the, at the end of the tour. So she would do presentations to all of them and try and get them toothbrush and toothpaste. So she had a real, think of the positive impact that that may have had. So another role of a dentist out on operations is doing peripatetic clinics. Now, this means the dentist or dental team flying out to treat the patient rather than them coming back to see us. This has been looked at, and on a typical tour, um, we would do 20 to 30 of these clinics. And typically, if soldiers had had to come back and see us, they would lose 1,200 days in total from operations. And then let's think about the risk involved as well. So here, this is a Chinook helicopter, and if someone had a problem with their teeth, this is how they'd have to get back, which is a huge expense, and it's also quite dangerous. So we were able to go out and bunch groups of patients together, save up dental problems, and then treat them en masse. But of course, you had to get out there. So uh, I, I look like a right geek again, don't I? With my cheesy thing, I was very excited by this vehicle. Um, these are really great, and these are very, very bomb-proof. And the reason for that was the risk of improvised explosive devices. So I didn't mind travelling in this kind of vehicle. Now, just to illustrate the point, this is a photograph that I've taken from a forward base. And this is a road that travels up to the north of Helmand province in Afghanistan. And just here is the junction from that road onto a track, which then comes around into this uh, forward base. And actually, when we were there, a vehicle got blown up just there, right in the front gates of the base, which is just crazy. And what had happened was, in the night, the Taliban had come up on a motorbike, jumped off, and it took them less than a minute to lay that. And if you look at the kind of damage it can do, they are bomb-proof, but they still get destroyed. Now, luckily, no one was injured in that. Um, but every time we travelled, obviously there was a risk. And just imagine if the hundreds of patients that we treated all had to travel to see us. Uh, and if people had been killed because they hadn't deployed with their teeth um, being you know, in a good state, that would just be really sad. This was definitely a preferred way to travel. So this is a C-130 up in Kandahar. You can tell by the snow. 
and, and they, they were ran really regularly and they were easy to get. But my favourite mode of transport of all was travelling by helicopter. So these are absolutely amazing machines, and I've got just a couple of pictures to show you what it's like travelling in them. So this is a photo taken out the back of a, a Chinook here. You can see the funny angle that it's at, because they, the pilots fly very, very low and very fast, and they, they basically kind of swoop from side to side to try and avoid getting shot at. And they travel at nearly 200 miles an hour, and when they get to where they want to be, they essentially perform what is a handbrake turn. It's absolutely amazing and then they just drop down. So you can see here, we're just basically skimming over rooftops, and you could literally see people hanging their washing out and then getting a huge shock as these helicopters flew overhead. So that's the dental kit. Everything that I showed you in that earlier picture is folded up and it, it, it's put into there, and we can load that onto a helicopter or a vehicle, and we can basically get out anywhere and deliver our dental care. That's what it looks like when it's set up. When I was doing a bit of research for this, um, I came across a photo from World War II, actually. And I don't think the kit's changed at all. But if it ain't broke, don't, don't fix it. That's what they say, isn't it? And uh, it's really, really solid kit. And I did actually drop one off the side of a helicopter, <laughs> embarrassingly. But it survived. A big dent in the box, but it was all right. When we get out to our clinics, we'd usually be hosted by the medical team. So there's a bunch of medics here. There's my dental nurse, uh, Kath. Um, I don't know why, I just look dreadful in the sunglasses, but never mind. Um, what we do is typically set up in a trauma room. So here you can see these are ready to receive stretchers, and this is my dental kit over to one side. So what we do is move that over, do our dentistry, and then if a call came in that there was a casualty on the way, we could just shift everything over, and then it became a trauma room again. Now, this did actually happen uh, every now and then, and as I've alluded to before, um, we would get stuck into managing those traumas. So again, as a dentist, they're not the kinds of things that I thought I would be involved in. Um, I put this photograph up because it kind of highlights a couple of things. This is in a forward base. This is your hand washing facilities. So you can start to think now the dentistry is not going to be ideal. And the other thing is, this is a bomb-proof shelter, and that's because this base was getting a lot of indirect fire. So it was having rockets and mortars land on it, sometimes several times a day. And that meant we had to always wear helmet and body armour. And obviously your patient can't really do that, and it's just a hopeless way to work. So we actually set up in this bomb-proof shelter. But it was really dark, it was really dusty, it was really difficult to work like that. And when we went back a couple of months later, <laughs> it was also really cold. Um, we all hear that the desert gets cold at night, but I can honestly say I've never ever been as cold as I was out there because there's just no escape from it. You're not going to go home at night and go to your nice warm bed. And it was that cold that the water was actually freezing in the system. So these are all the kinds of problems that we had to overcome. Another thing that we were involved with was managing trauma. So now we're back at Bastion and something happened out there um, which made us get involved in the trauma more and more. In my first couple of weeks out there, I was asked to go and see a patient on the ward who had had some life-saving surgery done, and he'd woken up from his general anaesthetic, and he was in absolute agony with his teeth. So I went to see him um, on the ward, and realised that several of his upper molars had shattered into little bits. So the picture of the nerve hanging out I showed you before, you can imagine that, but it was tenfold. <laughs> So this is a chap that was in absolute agony. There was no way he could eat or drink. And he's just had some major surgery done, which is just madness, isn't it? So I went to speak to the surgeons and I said, it might have been nice if we'd perhaps have been called in a bit sooner. And that's ultimately what happened from then on. So as dentists, we'd get involved in the trauma. As soon as it came in, we would assess the patients with the um, medics and we could then go in and take teeth out under general anaesthetic if that's what needed to be. And there were also no facial surgeons out there, so if there were any wounds on the face and they were relatively easy to close up, we could do that. If it was more serious trauma, then we would just literally clean the wounds out, put some big stitches in, and then they'd be flown back to Birmingham to, uh, to have further surgery done. So I'm just gonna put up a picture now, I'll warn you now. It's not, it's not a horrendous picture, but it does show a bit of blood. And this is just to show you what it's like in the operating theatres, okay? And you can see all the kind of 
the bloody rags on the floor here. So uh, this patient here will have had massive trauma. So when we were working on their um, teeth and on their face, they would often be having um, legs or arms removed. They would perhaps be having open heart surgery, abdominal surgery. It, it, I've never seen anything like it. And I've shown you that room on the, on the diagram of the hospital. There could be up to four of these operations going on all at the same time. So just to highlight that, I've got a few numbers for you here. This is the number of people killed in 2009 uh, when I went out there the first time. So there were 108 people killed. Now for every person that was killed, there were four or five soldiers that suffered what we call life-changing injuries. So these are lost arms, legs, eyes. So you're talking about four or five hundred soldiers that would have gone through that operating theatre. But these are only the British soldiers. We were actually looking after the Afghans, the Danes, the Americans and the Estonians. So you can multiply that by many fold and there were thousands. And what the doctors did out there, the surgeons, was absolutely incredible. And it, it certainly got a reputation of being the best trauma hospital in the world, which considering you're in the middle of the desert, is quite some feat. I'm just going to play you a clip now, um, and it just shows you basically what happened when a casualty came into that hospital. It's only about a minute long, um, it's from the news, um, and it, it just shows you just what a slick operation it was, and just how quickly people rece received that <coughs> surgery. Um, and you might even recognise someone in this. Well, the high-tech war against the Taliban here is matched by state-of-the-art field hospitals. They operate in all senses of the word, with military efficiency. Speed, of course, is of the essence when treating critical injuries. Our medical editor, Lawrence McGinty, has been to assess the care given to troops and examine the enormous pressures faced by the medical teams. He experienced firsthand a day in the life of a frontline ER. and an injured British soldier arrives at Bastion Hospital. Inside the emergency department, the helicopter is. Lee has shrapnel embedded in his right arm, face and eyes. Fragments from one of the Taliban's now infamous improvised explosive devices. 909 and a portable x-ray gives instant pictures to check the fractures. Superficial fragments in the upper arm. 919 and into the CT scanner. Consultants who will operate on Lee want to know how deep the shrapnel is. Things happen incredibly fast at the hospital in Camp Bastion. Patients can be here in the operating theatre within 30 minutes of being wheeled through the front door. Four consultant doctors operated on Lee, scrupulously picking out the shrapnel. That number of consultants would be unheard of in a hospital back home. There's even a dentist who had to extract two teeth. That was it. <laughs> Two seconds of fame. <laughs> and you can see my hairline was better then as well. Okay. Sadly, um, not everyone survived. And so another role that I've had as a military dentist is, is be to be involved in forensics. Uh, and the main branch of forensic odontology that I'm involved in is unfortunately identifying people. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to put a picture up, um, taken from inside a morgue now, um, of a deceased person. Um, there is a reason that I'm putting it up, but if you don't want to see it, I suggest you look away. Okay? Now, most people in this room know who that is. Does anyone want to tell me who that is? My wife knows because she's seen this presentation. That's Marilyn Monroe. So I think that highlights the point that you cannot rely on just identifying someone by how they look after they passed away. And that's our role as a forensic odontologist, is we will look at all of the evidence, um, so the x-rays and the dental charting, or it could even be dentures, um, it could be photographs. We look at all that evidence from before they passed away, and we compare it to what we can see after they've passed away. And even if they've suffered massive trauma, usually um, some of the teeth will have survived. 
and we only need a few teeth or even sometimes one tooth to be able to say that that is that person. So this is me at work, the hairline's starting to go wrong now as we can see. Um, what we would do is we would take x-rays of the deceased uh, and we would basically report back to the coroner what we can see. So this is a, this is a real report and this is only just an analysis of one x-ray and all of these points are things that I can see which tie in with that person being that person and that's just from one x-ray and so we would do this for all of the x-rays and present a body of evidence to the coroner and we would do so in a legal uh, police statement because what it's us that is saying yes that is that person and that's a huge responsibility and with all the things that I've done in the military it's it's probably one of one of the best things that I, that I have that I can do because it brings closure to people they're sat at home waiting to hear is is it their loved one that has passed away we think it probably is and it's me that can finally say yes it is and it just allows the grieving process to begin so it's a very difficult thing to do but it's a very very important thing to do and I have had cases where the police have told me we think we have that person and then I've had to turn around and say I can 100% say it is not that person um, and so again you think of the family in that situation also related to forensics I got involved with um, contributing to kind of aging detainees out in Afghanistan so this here is the prison out in Afghanistan and they contacted me and said would you mind coming down there's a prisoner who claims to be 14 but he's got a great big white beard and we don't think he is and they weren't that they knew that unless they were 18 years or older we can't hold them so every prisoner that came in was 14 and I was really unhappy about this because you can't say from someone's teeth whether they are or are not so I contacted an army lawyer I said I wasn't really very happy and he basically said they will take on board my statement and I will use other evidence as well and they will then make a decision on whether to hold them or not. So I was kind of okay with that but my caveat was generally yes they've got a lot of tooth wear, they have their wisdom teeth present, they are likely to be over 18 but I would always stop short and say they are over 18. Another role of the army dentist and this goes on uh, in Kenya still, um, but this was out in Afghanistan, is hearts and minds. Now, I think, uh, as history would tell us, you cannot win any kind of conflict unless you get the local population on side. So a major role of this is to try and provide medical care to the local population, and hopefully they'll realise that we're not there to cause mischief, we're there to try and help them. Not only that, if they're on side with you, they tend to tell you what's going on in the area. So they'll report to you on what the local enemy action is. So we were approached by the uh, SAS and also the Paras and asked if we would go with them on uh, a few tours of Helmand province. And, uh, and for some reason we thought it would be a good idea. So that's what we did. Now, this is driving out the front gates of Cambastian and uh, I'd be lying if I didn't say I was absolutely petrified at this point. As I've said, the main risk out there was the roadside bombs. One of the reasons I was petrified is because the SAS, I don't know why, but they just insist on travelling in ridiculous vehicles. Yeah. This was my practice, my, this was our first trip out, literally half an hour after leaving Bastion, and the wheel fell off. <laughs> At that point, we all had to dismount and take up a defensive position to allow that to be fixed. And it suddenly dawned on me just why we did all that training. Um, here we are driving along Highway 1, uh, which at the time I think was the most bomb road in the world. And it just became really normal. And I think the reason for that is because I really trusted these guys. They, they are the best soldiers in the world. And I kind of trusted them to spot any danger. We would tend to base out of the Special Forces uh, camp here, 
Now, what it says here is the home of the ATF. This is the Afghan Territorial Force. And these were some very, very highly trained Afghan soldiers. They were almost uh, the special forces, really, of the Afghan military. Now, much like their British counterparts, they like to travel in ridiculous vehicles. And we can intercept um, enemy chatter. And there were a few times when the Taliban were talking about the vehicle with the big flag. So they really weren't helping us out at all here. But they were really, really good fun, these guys. Now, this is us approaching uh, a village in the distance, and we tend to muster up. And then a few of these guys would go ahead, uh, and they'd speak to some of the locals and see if they wanted help or not. You can see here one of the British vehicles has gone onto some high ground. Uh, and in this case, I can remember they'd set up some mortars and they'd got a big uh, 50 caliber machine gun on here. So if anything bad happened, uh, I definitely felt like I could essentially run off and I'd be protected. And this was us driving through one of the villages. Um, now, I got, we did this quite a lot and I got a feeling before we went in whether they would want us or not. If it was a lovely plush green village with great irrigation and uh, a few poppies, you could pretty much guarantee they had links with the Taliban and they probably didn't want your help. If it was a really, really dry, poor village with no electricity, no running water, um, they would usually want some, some help. Now I saw poverty out there like I've never ever seen before and I'll, I'll, I'll show you some slides as well of that. Now this is um, just chatting to some of the locals here. So essentially asking them if they want us to come in and help them. And they were very, very tentative at first. We didn't get many takers. Um, these are my interpreters out on tour. Ridiculous people. They're pointing a loaded AK-47 uh, at this chap here. But they were great fun. Now if anyone here works on the NHS and they have to use a language line and they complain about the interpreters, then it's going to fall on deaf ears with me, because these guys were really hard work. Here's the typical setup. You can see the first thing that went up for me was the shade. Factor 50 was doing nothing for me, being a ginger, and uh, I always tried to do that. But you can see how difficult it is to work here, how difficult it is to provide dentistry. Um, where do you put your instruments? How do you keep things clean? It was really, really tough, and in the end, we just refined things to a bag of forceps, some local anaesthetic, because that was realistically all you could do. Now, we're going to look here at my first patient. It's a really terrible uh, picture, so I apologise about that. As I say, people were very tentative. They didn't really want help at first, and this chap um, came out of his house, and he banged his head, uh, and, he, and he cut his head quite badly, so he came kind of wandering up and said was there anything we could do. So I numbed him up, uh, sutured his, his, uh, his head, and he thought it was absolutely amazing. And he loved it so much that he then had a load of teeth out as well. <laughs> now, the great thing about this, I think this, this was the turning point for our little operations we were doing, because he then went and spoke to his mates, and then we had an absolute influx from that village. And then what we found was, we would go back to the village a month later, and the queue was even bigger. And then the word spread around Hellman. There's this dentist traveling around and he can help you out. And the stories that I would hear were people walking for three days to find the nearest dentist. A dentist then with no local anesthetic, failing to take the tooth out, and then the patient having to walk back home again, still in pain. And I could just numb someone up and take the tooth out in 10 minutes. And they thought it was amazing. Even got the kids involved. I'm not sure about this anxiety management. <laughs> I think I've seen Kath Wilson in the audience there. <laughs> so, yeah, I just had to roll with it at the end of the day. What can you do? That, I think that was one of the interpreters. What, you know. But we were still mates afterwards. He didn't, he didn't uh, fall out with me over that one. A few random things as well that I got involved in. So here we made friends with the, one of these... Uh, military working dogs. These are very, very, very highly trained and they will only actually attack you on command. <laughs> but they don't let go. 
And that was my dental nurse laughing there, very sympathetic. I have to say that I had the last laugh though, because we did a quite a bit of doggy dentistry out there. So I was surgically removing a fractured canine here from a dog, uh, and I realised that dogs' canines are absolutely massive, so usually needs a surgical approach to avoid breaking it. And I even managed to do a root canal filling on a dog at one point. So it has been really, really hard work. But being in the military, we get some great opportunities as well. So I've done a fair bit of adventure training in my time. This was out on safari in Kenya. And this was just last year. I was walking the GR20 in Corsica. Now, I've done all kinds of things. I've trained as a, a mountain leader with the military. I've done some rock climbing, mountain biking. It's been an absolutely great experience. One of the best experiences was meeting Freddie. So Freddie Flintoff, uh, along with some other celebrities, came out to see us. Um, most of them were a bit miserable, but Freddie, he spent an hour in the dental centre, and we had him actually playing cricket with us with rolled up paper balls. Absolutely brilliant bloke. So that kind of brings us to the end, really, of the roles of the military dentist. Um, what I'd like to do is just remember the 454 soldiers uh, that were killed out in Afghanistan. And when I was out there, it, it really changed me and it really affected me. And the realities of war are absolutely awful. But then I think back to World War I and II, and there were over a million people killed. And then the survivors had to come back and get on with their normal lives. And that brings us back to my wife's granddad. You're going to love this picture going up, Helen. Um, but this is Alfie, and obviously had been injured, but he never ever spoke about the war. Um, the only thing he ever mentioned was the dentist that saved him. So we'd also like to remember um, people like Alfie. And that's it. So we can have some questions. Um, proud to say that you've, you've seen some stuff. I'm sure there'll be some questions around uh, the auditorium. We've got any any hands? We've got a roving microphone here. Yes, Nick. Thanks very much, Alan. Absolutely fascinating. So. Um, from uh, my point of view, you can probably uh, um, guess what sort of question I'm going to ask as an anthropologist. Don't be too technical. <laughs> so you're, 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 you're practicing infection control out there in the dust and, and dirt. And how, how many people did get sort of infections as you do dentistry? Was it a big, big issue that you had to combat? Um, no, not at all. I mean, the, the hearts and minds operations, I mean, I guess we'd never know because we would be visiting up to five villages a day, so we'd take a load of teeth out and move on, so I guess you wouldn't know. But what choice did you have? Because if we didn't do it, there was a dentist three days walk away with no local anaesthetic. <laughs> so, I mean, I think, as, you, as we all know, you know, the dentists in the room, the mouth is a very filthy environment anyway, and the ability for it to heal is absolutely amazing. So I wouldn't say that dental infections were a massive problem unless there was an underlying problem before the soldier went out. So I think if someone had got an abscess cooking away for a few years, if it was going to cause a problem, it would be out there. And I don't think it was really the dirty conditions. I think it was the malnourishment and the stress. So we put the picture up of the, uh, the necrotizing gingivitis, the, uh, the trench mouth, we did see a lot of that. The other thing, one of the biggest things we saw uh, were infections around wisdom teeth. Um, we know, obviously, we don't take them out prophylactically anymore to avoid problems in the future, but I wish we had done. Um, and actually, we've rewritten the military doctrine on this, and we can now do that. Um, so if we think the wisdom tooth is going to cause a problem, we can go against you know, nice guidelines, and we can take it out because we know if it is going to cause a problem, it'll be in the middle of a patrol base out on operations. So yeah, I guess I did see a lot of infections out there, 
but I, I don't think it was really a result of our work. I think it was just underlying issues that, that came to the fore. Yeah. I want to ask you a question about <clears throat> what you've decided to follow up your experience with. And the reason I'm interested in this is that my father was in the uh, Royal Dunkel uh, during the Second World War. He was with the Eighth Army and, and uh, had a very interesting and demanding experience dealing with those facial injuries. Um, so I'm asking you, because I know what he did, um, in response to that situation, what are you going to do now? What, in my current role? In your, in your career. Role. In my career. Um, well, the reason I left was twofold. Um, I absolutely loved my job in the army. And I, it's a wonderful way to provide dental care. And it's a wonderful thing you can do. Um, but um, I, I basically left for family reasons. So I had wife and two children in the northeast. But I also left for career reasons because... I kind of felt like I'd really experienced everything that the army was going to offer me um, and I wanted to kind of progress my professional career. So I've been very, very lucky to get a job at Newcastle Dental Hospital um, where I'm doing some specialist training in root canal treatments. So my doggy dentistry was definitely good preparation for that. <laughs> and I'm also doing some research at the moment, so I'm hoping in the future to do a PhD as well. So hope, hopefully I'll go down the academic route. I'm, I'm still young enough, despite the hairline. And he will be an absolutely tremendous asset to our profession, I have to it's say. nice of you to say. Um, judging from our early months with him, he's brings an extraordinary skill set, an extraordinary work ethic and way of looking at things. And it's a real privilege to have him with the team here. Yes? Um, thanks, Dave. That was amazing. Um, I'm quite lucky that I have the pleasure to know you personally. Um, thank you for having me today. Um, <laughs> and also, I know that obviously, you know, you have sort of the two people. You have the soldier and then you have the dentist. And I know you personally and I know you're generally one of the most relaxed people I know. <laughs> and my question is that how do you feel that going into your profession now, going from when you had such sort of traumatic times and high stress situations, coming to Newcastle now, how do you think that doing that time in the army has changed you as a dentist? Um, I don't know. I mean, working with the soldiers is re it's really, really different. They're absolutely wonderful, wonderful patients. Um, so definitely, the kind of working environment is very different. I think if you ask people if I changed as a person, because I did work at the dental hospital from 2005 to 2007, and a lot of the, the staff are the same, and most people have said I've not, I've not changed at all. Um, but actually, um, I'd, I still get upset when I think back. It was dreadful. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't think professionally I've really changed other than I kind of have the attitude of just get on with it. So if there's any surgery or anything, but I've kind of had to rein that in a bit because I've been in a training post. So, uh, you know, and a lot of that was, you were just kind of having to do, a, do the job because there was no one else to do it. Whereas obviously it's a huge support team now. So yeah, I don't know. I don't think I've, I've outwardly changed as a person, um, but I guess, my, I guess my approach to think, I guess, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Probably just the same, the same day, yeah. Thanks Dave, that was a good talk. Um, I was really interested to hear about um, soldiers choosing to ditch their toothbrush for six months while they go on tour. It's probably indicative of an underlying lack of awareness about dental health amongst people in the UK or some sects of the UK. Do you think we're doing as much as we can in the UK to tackle that? Is there more we could be doing? What more do you think we should be doing to try and help people at an earlier age so they don't ditch their toothbrush at the first opportunity? Yeah, it's really hard because um, 
I, I had you know, one of my jobs was treating new recruits, and I would genuinely have people that had never brushed their teeth in their life. And I, my record, I'd, it sounds awful to call it that, but I actually did a full clearance on an 18 year old, which is really awful and really sad. So, you know, and I think, I mean, we actually obviously recruit from lower socioeconomic groups and the average reading age is uh, under the age of 11 for 40% of the recruits. So they definitely come from um, more difficult backgrounds. And so, but what I think the army gives them though, is they go through basic training and they, even the, the, you know, the corporal section commander on exercise, who's no knowledge of dentistry, they're so on board with dentistry in the army now that they're getting, they're doing toothbrushing drills on exercise. So they'll be out in the field <laughs> in the middle of a forest at four in the morning and they're being made to brush their teeth. The buy-in from the army is absolutely amazing. And I just think it's a fallout of, we know how important it is. So yeah, we do recruit from more difficult backgrounds and people are brushing their teeth when they join. But the amount of effort that goes into them to, to kind of raise everyone's oral health up is, is amazing. And I guess they're getting a fresh start, but yeah, for some people they're having dozens of teeth out, it's dreadful, yeah. Thanks, thanks. Uh, Dave, thanks very much for a really great talk. Um, you started off your talk by saying when patients come in, when people come into your uh, surgery, they say, I hate dentists. <laughs> um, and obviously, the work that I do, I work with a lot of very anxious patients. What do you do with uh, uh, soldiers or recruits that you get who basically say they're very, very anxious, they can't manage to have their dental treatment programs that well? Well, as you know, I'm quite keen on sedation, Cathy. <laughs> um, I, I, my experience is that I think anxiety is higher in the military. There, there is published data, actually, that dental anxiety is two to three times higher in the military. And some of that will be due to socioeconomic status as well. But I personally think a lot of it is, is due to the trauma that people have gone through as well. So... Um, as an example, on my second tour, I had to see a, a patient who had uh, been injured by a grenade, and he was he was so he was he was basically crying as I was taking his tooth out. He was, but he knew that he had to do it, and he did it. And afterwards, he was just so happy, and he bought me a present. And that wasn't normal for him. He was only responding like that to my treatment because he'd been injured. And I do, I do think there'll be a lot of soldiers who have been injured that will have a high level of dental anxiety. But what I tend to do is, if it's just the normal anxious patient, they would always say to me, they love coming in because I never really push the whole rank thing. Because all our patients call us sir, which is excellent, and you would all be very jealous of that <laughs> as dentists. Um, but I would just drop that and I, would, I could spend time with them. I could chat to them, see how the day's going. I can use techniques to make it less painful. Because that's the other thing is it's, I wasn't paid on my output of work. I had all the time in the world with these guys, within reason. Um, so yeah, I mean, I could spend an hour doing a filling for someone if that's what it took to get it done. So it's, military dentistry is about, you know, putting the patient first. We provide what they need just for free. So it's not on what we can afford to do, it's not what the patient can afford to pay. We literally just do what we can to get to get the job done, to get the best level of care. So I, I don't know, I think our management of anxiety is pretty good. Can Ooh. I just make one other point actually on that? Um, we are actually seeing quite a lot of people within our department of work, in the station department, um, who uh, have PTSD mm -hmm. following being in the military. Um, and sometimes that, that can actually have an effect and, and sort of um, manifest itself in dental anxiety and having things very close, you know. Definitely. You. Is there any, are, are you aware of, of whether these um, personnel can actually get any treatment with this or any management of this? For the PTSD? Yeah, PTSD, yeah. 
I don't, I know, I'm honestly know down the military route. I mean, there are support networks um, out there, but yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, once they've left the military, it's hard. But there are there are charities, and th there is a way of accessing care. But yeah, it is. It is as I say, I, I was really affected by it. Now, if you were a soldier on the front line, and you've had to witness your best mate die in front of you, um, you can imagine there's a lot of people out there with PTSD. It would be a massive underlying problem from that conflict. And even in dentistry, we will see the impact of that because they will have higher anxiety levels. Yeah. One more question. It's just a very simple question. I was just thinking in terms of how much the soldiers have got to carry in their packs. I was wondering whether the toothpaste was in a more concentrated formulation, thinking of the volume of what they've got to carry. Good thinking, Alan. <laughs> uh, no, it's, we, what we would do is we'd, well, it was Louise was the driver. She would just write to all the companies and she, they would ship out thousands of the little tubes and the soldiers <coughs> loved those little tubes for taking away with them. Um, so yeah, it was just normal, normal toothpaste. But you mentioned the, you know, how much they're carrying. Um, what you can see on all the vehicles is the aerials, uh, loads of aerials. That's called electronic countermeasures. And there's five different types of those uh, against different types of threat. So um, what the enemy would do is they'd lay a bomb and then they'd hide and they could detonate it, for example, with a mobile phone or they could detonate it with a walkie-talkie. And so all those aerials stop it going off. But soldiers, when they're on patrol, they had to carry those five different types of countermeasures with them. Now, I had to go at carrying these and... The, the electronic countermeasures combined with all of that ammunition and everything is 55 kilograms, which is more than some people in this room's body weight. It, I don't know how they did that for 12 hours a day and fought in it. So yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting point. Yeah. Could I ask, Dave, how, how much pressure are these sorts of services under? I mean, we have these images of, of these extraordinarily resourced facilities and you know operating yeah. theatres and all the rest of it and in times of, of you know austerity and, and budget cuts to, to services do, do you have any sense that these medical and dental services are under, coming under pressure coming under threat within that context it's it's very much under threat it's very sad um, and a few years ago, we did think the Royal Army Dental Corps would be no more. And we've gone, when I joined, there were about 140 dentists. And when I left, there were 64. So it's, it's, it's been savaged. Um, but I did mention a few stats there about the 1,200 uh, days that were lost. Yeah. And someone actually published that work, and that probably saved us. Um, so yes. Dentistry, we do know how important it is, but it's like everything else, it's basically been civilianised. And so they'll probably end up with a core, I would suspect, of 30 or 40 dental officers, and then everything else will be civilian. It's just how it is. Yeah. One final question, if there is one. Yes. Um, wonderful lecture, and I'm delighted that your training... Let's just have the microphone. Wonderful lecture. I'm delighted that your training was very adequate because when I was in final year, Jack Hood thought we would be called up to fight the Six Day War and thought one afternoon was sufficient to train us. <laughs> yeah, I'd probably add it all together. It was probably about five or six weeks training we did before we went out. Solid training, it was really good. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, described as an insights program, and I certainly think that we've had insights into all sorts of extraordinary things this evening. And uh, you know, admire and respect the, the service that you and your colleagues provide to our nation and the troops that fight on our behalf. Thank you, David, very much for sharing. Ladies and gentlemen, do look out for events later on in the year that will be uh, celebrating other aspects of our life and work in the dental school and hospital in Newcastle. Let's thank David and let's uh, say good evening to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. That was really fun. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah.